Good morning. Okay, so today we're going to talk about um, a case that I got to see the first week that I was here, um, which was pretty exciting for me. We had a 49-year-old uh, lady come in. She was previously healthy. She was a retired business professor, um, had retired at 49 because they'd, they'd sold some type of pharmaceutical company, um, so she'd done pretty well for herself. Um, and she had a two-month history of lower extremity weakness, hearing loss, and uh, new onset decreased visual field loss um, in the right eye. So this had all begun about uh, a couple months prior, August uh, 2010. She kind of seen been seen at several different hospitals. Um, she presented initially to Provo, Utah with um, some weakness, some sensory loss in her legs, urinary incontinence, um, vertigo, and gait instability. She had an MRI at the outside hospital, and that showed some increased T2 flare signals in the deep cortex. She also had an EMG there that showed some decreased amplitude in the tibial nerves. Uh, she was diagnosed there with uh, Guillain-Barre. She was treated with five days of IVIG, um, discharged with physical therapy, and she thought for the, the next six weeks that she was improving. She had, uh, from then, she had an, an onset of gradual hearing loss in her right ear, um, worsening gait instability. They started, on, started her on uh, prednisone and vamcyclovir. Um, she also had a new onset of a severe bitemporal headache, um, some increased weakness and um, kind of numbness in the lower extremities, worse on the right. She had another MRI at that time, which showed um, some more signal in, on T2 flare, which looked like MS. And she was experiencing some pretty severe vertigo at that time, and she was transferred to a Colorado hospital. She had an INO. She was hyperreflexic. Um, she had an LP there. But the CSF showed no oligoclonal bands, um, but did show some elevated protein. Pretty much pan-normal uh, lab workup. Uh, as you can see, kind of got the full, full spectrum Lyme, HSV, um, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. And she was treated with uh, three days of IV steroids at that time. So she was discharged. She was still having some of the symptoms. She got a dose of IVIG, didn't really improve. Um, and then she started having some confusion, some word-finding difficulties, some cognitive slowing. Um, and so when she presented to the University of Utah, she had a right foot drop, she had hearing loss on the right side, and she'd uh, woken up the day prior with some decreased visual field on the right side. Um, there was no pain with uh, extraocular movement. Her acuity was great. She was 20-20 with correction um, and no photopsias. As far as past medical history, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, she was previously healthy, had uh, some gestational diabetes and uh, a bout of uh, acute gastroenteritis while traveling in Ireland uh, pretty recently. Her only medications were a multivitamin. She'd been started on Lyrica a couple months prior for uh, the worsening headaches for migraine. Uh, and one of the physicians had started her on Doxy for uh, suspected Lyme disease. Um, ocular history, she'd worn glasses since the age of 12. Um, and notice in quotations it says ocular migraines because those are the, the patient's words. I know that's not a, a preferred term here. Um, and past neurological history, just the migraines uh, with aura since the age of 8, but um, maybe one every six months and pretty good relief with ibuprofen. One episode of uh, loss of consciousness when she was 9 due to a skiing accident and she was out for a couple days there. Family history was significant for a cerebral aneurysm and a sister at age 40 and a maternal grandmother who had also had a hemorrhage. Um, no family history of MS. So on exam, again, visual acuity was um, really good. She 2020 uh, OU, pressures were great. Um, kind of really the only abnormality there is stereo. Um, and then uh, fields to confrontation, she had uh, peripheral loss with central sparing and uh, no deficits in the left eye. And she did not have an INO when she presented here. So here are her prior scans. Um, this is the first one that we have, and you can see the, the, a couple of hyper-intense signals here. Um, this is the, scan, the next scan that we have, the second MRI that she had. And you can notice a little area of hypo uh, intensity right here in the corpus callosum. 
She continued to have several hyperintense regions. This is when uh, they started really seriously considering MS. And then the scan uh, that she had when she presented here. Um, again, you can see these areas of uh, hypo-intense regions. I think also kind of here, you, you can start to see those. Again, several hyperintense uh, lesions on MRI, kind of scattered throughout. And then fundus photographs. Um, so right eye, and she's got an occlusion right here. Left eye looked pretty good um, initially. And we got FA. And some clear abnormalities here, these areas of, of hyperintensity. And then you can see the um, artery occlusion. Left eye also showed the areas of hyperintensity. And in the periphery, um, another occlusion. We were able to get her records from, um, I believe it was Colorado where they got this study. Um, and it showed, Wyoming. Wyoming. Um, and it showed uh, low frequency hearing loss. And so uh, differential diagnosis. Um, so kind of on the list at that time was uh, multiple sclerosis, ADEM, Lyme disease. She'd been diagnosed previously with Guillain-Barre. Um, and then sex syndrome. So she actually um, kind of meets all the criteria for SUSEC syndrome. It was first described in 1979. Um, there's at least 200 cases reported. Um, it usually affects young women and it favors women three to one. Uh, the classic triad is encephalopathy, hearing loss, and branch retinal artery occlusions. They're usually bilateral and so we see all three in this case. The pathology of it is it's thought to be an immune-mediated uh, uh, endotheliopathy. Um, it affects the brain, the retina, and uh, the cochlea. Um, on a this is a, um, from a paper where they were able to do a retinal biopsy of a patient who unfortunately passed away while they were experiencing SUSEC syndrome. And it, um, you can see these serous deposits kind of in between the, the membrane and the vasculature anteriorly. And those are found um, kind of intermittently throughout the arteries. And also there's some thickening of the walls in the areas where there's not the serous deposits. Um, and so that the thickening is noted to be different from diabetic thickening. It's serous versus um, a glycolated um, PAS positive with diabetes and, and not all vessels were thickened uh, with SUSAC's patients. Um, there was no evidence of thrombus in any of the occluded vessels. Uh, it looked like it was just from the endothelial swelling, and some of the articles actually kind of compared it to juvenile um, dermatomyositis, which also has occluded vessels from uh, endothelial swelling. Um, and it kind of hinted at maybe some glial cell dysfunction um, with the sequestration of the fluid. Um, none of the brain biopsies showed any necrosis in the vessel wall, so it's not a vasculitis, it's a vasculopathy. Um, and the mechanism is still really unknown, but some of the theories that have been put out have been either anti-endothelial antibodies or a T-cell attack or maybe complement-mediated damage. The classic findings on MRI, um, really the corpus callosum uh, is pathognomonic in the encephalopathic patient. It's best seen on a sagittal T2 flare, which may not always be ordered, so if you suspect SUSEC, uh, you want to get a sagittal T2 flare um, MRI. Um, the microinfarcts in, uh, prefer the, the, the central por portion of the corpus callosum, and it's described as snowballs with uh, e evolving to holes, um, and it occurs only uh, in SUSEC. Um, another finding is the string of pearls, and it's a studying of the internal capsule by microinfarcts. I've got some pictures of that, uh, best shown on diffusion weighted imaging. Leptomeningeal enhancement is also classic in gray matter involvement. So here are the snowball pictures in the corpus callosum and that invo uh, evolved into the holes, which we saw actually um, with our patient. And the string of pearls um, 
picture here on diffusion weighted imaging. Um, so on FA, you'll see arterial wall hyperfluorescence. Um, it's often multifocal um, with uh, branch retinal artery occlusions, and they may be peripheral. Uh, again, as we saw in our patient in the left eye, there's one uh, at the far periphery. If it's normal initially and you suspect CSAC, um, they recommend doing repeated FAs um, at, at differing intervals. Another unusual feature of this syndrome is, is, uh, are the gas plaques, and they're actually kind of mid-segment um, plaques in the arterioles, which are different from the hole and horse plaques, which are usually at the bifurcations. The encephalopathy uh, evolves subacutely. Um, often these patients will present with psychiatric features. They may be found in the psych wards. Um, they'll have extensor plantar responses, may have seizures, um, and frequently have headaches. Hearing loss due to infarction of cochlea, uh, uh, frequently associated with vertigo, uh, much like our patient presented with, um, low frequency hearing loss. Um, and this is one of the, uh, in terms of prognosis, one of the, the um, main residual factors for CSACs is that they often continue to have hearing loss and they'll require cochlear implants. So often the, the patients kind of get worked up for atypical MS or atypical ATEM. Um, and so some of the differences between that uh, in MS and ATEM, uh, the closal involvement is usually under the closum, and in SUSACs, uh, the central fibers of the closum are involved, um, and it's demyelination versus microinfarcts. Um, MS uh, doesn't usually have leptomeningeal enhancement, um, and deep gray matter involvement is usually also rare in MS, um, as is deafness. So there's a lot of a lot of words on the slide, but kind of um, the, the basic is um, the traditional treatment is usually uh, pulse treatment with IV methylprednisone, um, followed by high dose oral prednisone, and then IVIG, um, and then cyclophosphamide or, or microphenolate. Some papers discuss um, a differing treatment plan for those patients who just present without encephalopathy. Um, although it follows this, a similar pattern, IVIG, steroids, um, they, it may be at a, um, a, a slower taper, but they caution that, um, that you know, with the unpredictability of encephalopathy that uh, you may still want to treat pretty aggress aggressively for this. Additional treatment options are uh, rituximab, which is a monoclonal antibody to just uh, CD20 po uh, positive B cells. And those are found only on mature B cells, not on the stem cells or the plasma cells. Um, it takes about eight months to replace those cells. Um, if patients aren't responding to conventional therapy, you might want to consider plasmapheresis. For those patients who were initially diagnosed with MS and were treated with interferon, it has not been shown to be successful for treatment, and often those patients worsen um, clinically. Monitoring includes serial ophthalmology exams, um, following with audiology, neuropsych testing, and um, repeat MRIs. Their prognosis can vary. Uh, it can be monocyclic. There can be remission after a couple of years, and they never have another episode of this. It can be polycyclic, where it recurs again, kind of in a short period. Um, or it can be chronic, where they have a prolonged, continuous course in which the disease is active. Um, they frequently see that for the patients who just present with um, branch retinal artery occlusions. There was one patient that had a kind of a chronic course over about 30 years. So in summary, Susex syndrome, it's frequently misdiagnosed. Uh, it's a triad of encephalopathy, hearing loss, and branch retinal artery occlusion. Um, the pathology is thought to be an autoimmune endothelial disorder, and the treatment is usually with um, steroids, uh, with the length of, length of treatment depending on patient response. Um, the newest therapy is rituximab, and you want to follow the patients closely. Um, if uh, during the steroid taper um, they're decompensating, uh, you want to increase the dosage. Prognosis, again, varies from complete remission to uh, continued cognitive impairment and hearing loss. Um, but blindness uh, is actually rare. So for our patient, her clinical course um, she received a three-day course of IVIG and developed some leukopenia, uh, pretty severe. 
Um, her husband was kind of concerned at that time and actually wanted her work back up for Lyme disease, um, which they did and got an infectious disease consult, um, but it was all negative. Um, she didn't, they didn't agree to steroid treatment, and she got three days of uh, solumedrol, and I uh, was going to be started on rituximab therapy closer to home. As far as um, her condition on discharge, she was still having pretty unsteady gait. She still had the right uh, upper field visual defect and was uh, still having some weakness in her legs. Any questions? You didn't show the visual fields. I didn't show the visual fields, you're right. And I didn't because they were not very reliable. She, when she came to us, she was, um, she was very, very tired, very confused, and um, I think kind of fell asleep during the visual fields, actually. I believe they're from the, the vascular occlusions. Yes. Is it believed now that a lot of her older nurses were following her to get her to the detox? Yes. Yes. A couple of interesting things you should know about Mar. This is a former nurse doctor. But more importantly, she's had good luck on holding on to the Kentucky. <laughs> 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 Any other questions? Okay, thank you.